Good morning and welcome to Practical Christian Lessons. We are going over the Methodist 25 articles today and we are almost done. Only five articles left, 21 through 25. Yeah, 25, 21 through 25. Um, and I'm, I don't quite have a plan exactly for what we're going to be starting next week. Um, but we will be going through, reading through something else. Don't, don't worry, the read-throughs will never end here. Um, always more things to read. If you're not already part of our Discord, um, feel free to check out our doobly-doo below or on our actual YouTube profile page, and you will get a link there to our Discord where you can find stuff like our videos on this. Um, and the playlist for this is linked in the doobly-doo below, so you can always go and find that. Um, you can ask us questions about this and anything else we've covered on this topic or things we haven't covered yet. Um, happy, happy to have discussions and just encourage trying our best to live out scriptural holiness and pursuing the Lord together and sharing our faith with others. I think that both those are like super important things and things we should be striving to do. Um, as for the articles today, we are covering the marriage of ministers and the not that's the wrong one and the rites and ceremonies of the church. Um, for a, a good in-depth video on the marriage of ministers, Article 21, Gavin Ortland recently put out a video on this exact matter. Um, I think it was this month in July. Maybe it was the end of June. I'm not entirely sure. Everything is kind of blurry after a little bit. Um, but I encourage going to watch that video for a full in-depth discussion on this exact topic because just like Gavin Ortland, I'm going to highlight the fact that this article um, on the marriage of ministers is related to a controversy that was really started about it very early in the church um, and then briefly before there was when the church of the far east joined with the with the greek church when the roman empire was one large church before you know 1054 before eastern orthodox and roman catholics split and became their own church there was another church in the far east that had been uh, served by thomas and sort of came in and joined the church and now they, they're also their own splinter off before the 1054 schism. This is some, some church history for you fellow nerds. Um, and they, they have a big role to play in part of this particular tradition that came out. Which is, the ministers of Christ are not commanded by God's law to take a vow of singleness or to abstain from marriage. Therefore, it is lawful for them, as for all other Christians, to marry at their own discretion. They should decide according to what will best help them in godly service. And this definitely ties in the idea that both marriage and celibacy, um, a life of singleness, both of these should be viewed as a gift from God. Whatever God calls you to have in your life, um, people should not be shaming each other for one or the other. But we also shouldn't be mandating it. Um, the reason I brought up that brief history lesson is because there was this huge fight in the early church on whether or not ministers should get married. Even though it's clear in the verses we go over today will show that it was the practice of the apostles and before ministers were married. This is just a hard fact. Um, and this is something that people agree on, even the, the people who had this debate. Um, this wasn't a debate on what does the scriptures mandate, because the scriptures were clear. Priests and ministers are married. They're allowed to get married. One of the commands, one of the rules for a minister is husband of one wife. That's in the rules. And or not the rules, the qualifications for being an elder. And so there, there's no there's no debate on whether what the scriptural <laughs> point forward is. This is purely a tr matter of man-made tradition. That That's just a hard fact. Um, what the Far East Church did when they came in was they actually brought something in that they were doing, which was allowing priests to be married before they were ordained. And afterwards, um, once they were ordained, they couldn't get married. Or if their wives died after they got ordained, they weren't able to get remarried. And that that was kind of the tradition that was seen as like the the most like acceptable answer for the church of that stage. Because it appeased those who wanted to restrict marriage for the priesthood. And a lot of this comes out of practical reasons. Um, but also allowed for them to still have the chance to get married. And a, a lot of what you'll hear in the practicality reason Right, and these are some some good points. However, I think the scripture <laughs> scriptures show a clear point why this should is still a big problem, and it, this is not the solution to the problem. Um, and that was like you know when someone's a priest in a local area, you don't want them abusing that. Um, you don't want them to be above someone and basically sort of pressure this person into marrying them. Um, 
you look into the history of uh, John Wesley and other ministers throughout time, there are there are periods, especially in John Wesley's youth, and he reflected on this later in his life, and he he noted that his first trip into the colonies was one of his biggest failures as a priest in his entire life, and part of that was what happened when a woman rejected him and started dating someone else, and he was rejecting them from the Lord's Supper, from the Eucharist. And he, when he looked back on that later in life, he noted that entire episode, but that as a part of his biggest failure in being a priest. Um, but then, then part of the worries is stuff like that happening, pretty much. But that's a purely practical reason. And yes, it's an important thing, and things like that can happen. Um, but our answer <laughs> shouldn't be an overcorrection and going to something that itself is wrong and shouldn't be done. You don't correct something that's wrong with something that's wrong. You correct something that's wrong with something that's right. And some of the scriptures we're going to go to on this today are Matthew eight fourteen. And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law laying sick with a fever. Peter himself was married. We we can confirm most, if not all, of the apostles were married. There are some some arguments about whether um, Paul himself was married because one of the rules for Pharisees involved marriage. So they're not sure. Maybe he was married and a widower. Uh, maybe he wasn't married. They're not entirely sure. There's there's no like clear spot that says Paul was Paul is a widower or Paul was once married. There's, there's nothing that says it, but there's also nothing that says he was married. So you, you get some ambiguity there. 1 Corinthians 9, 5. This is Paul talking. Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Cephas being Peter here. So another reference to Peter being married and the other apostles. Um, as here, you know, he doesn't say that all other 11 apostles are married, but he doesn't say that, you know, there's some who aren't married. Um, that's why some some people argue, like, we're all 11 apostles married. And this just shows, right, all of the apostles, and in this case, Paul and his uh, his fellow traveling ministers um, with him, not just apostles, but also priests and elders, have the right to, as he puts it here, do we have the not have the right to take along a believing wife? Which implies that marriage is allowed, and if they are married, that they, they have a, a right to have their wife traveling with them. Hebrews 13.4 let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. All right, honor marriage. And then Numbers 12.1, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman who he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And right, just noting, Moses, one of the figures that is the foreshadowing of, of Christ himself, he is the prophet. Then in Deuteronomy, he mentions the prophet who will come after him, that the people need to follow, which is Jesus. Um, noting here, all the way back to Moses, um, marriage is, is clearly allowed in the roles of ministers and prophets and priests. And then 1 Corinthians 7, 9, this is an important one, and this is something that doesn't get brought up in these discussions, is, but if you cannot exercise, exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. All right, there's a reason celibacy is called a gift in the church. And that is because it's not something just anyone can do. It has to be a gift from God. Um, or as, as Paul says here, they will burn with passion. So the modern church, um, in reaction, I think, a lot to this this sort of extreme. And in the early church, some very negative views on sex and marriage, even sex within marriage that popped up throughout church history, um, led to a chain of reactions, and I think our modern modern church and world has overreacted and gone too far in the other way, where you'll find a lot of places in the modern church where that, like, shame celibacy, and, like, if you're not married or you're single, they think something's wrong with you. Um, or even if they don't think that or say that, that's the, very much the way they treat you. And I, I've even heard from some women, some of my older uh, churches, that unfortunately, right, you know, her husband died when she was older. And she mentioned, and this breaks my heart, that um, when she became a widow, it felt like the church forgot about her. And that's just not right. Um, I'm going to keep it together, I promise. But that, that there, there is very much an overreaction on one end. So like, we need to stop swinging between these pendulums and find, find the happy center and, and honoring when someone is single, you know, that's okay. When someone, if someone's married, that's okay, right? People are called to different things. And we need to recognize that and learn how to help people discern whatever their path is that God has set for them and not be trying to force them into one or the other. Uh, and then the next article, Article 22, the rites and ceremonies of churches. And there won't be any scriptures for this one. Um, 
it is not necessary that rites and ceremonies be exactly the same in every church. They have always been different and can be changed according to the diverse needs of countries, times, and cultures, so long as nothing is instituted that is against God's word. Whoever, by his private judgment, willingly, purposely, and openly disregards the rites and ceremonies of the church to which he belongs, which are not opposed to the word of God, and are ordained and approved by the common authority, should be openly rebuked. That way others may be reticent to follow the offender's example against the church's common order and wound the consciences of weak believers. Every particular church may institute change or abolish rites and ceremonies as long as all things are done in an edifying way. And right, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and this, is, this, again, was sort of controversial in some parts where of the church where, and even still today in some parts of the church where they're saying like, this is the exact liturgy we use and must use. There's no question. There's no room for deviation. It has to be exactly this, um, which they're saying is wrong. And of course, right, the answer to that isn't just by private judgment, willingly, purposely, or in openly disregarding rites and ceremonies of the church to which they belong. So if you're going to a church and you disagree with how they're doing things, right, your church shouldn't be trying to to say, like, this is how our tradition has always done it, therefore we will do it this exact way and not change anything under any circumstances. But your reaction to that as a member in the church is not to just <laughs> start disregarding and being rebellious and causing problems. Um, it is to, you can speak out and say, hey, I think, you know, this is where we need to adjust, maybe change some things. Um, but you need to be respectful and and acknowledge there is a church authority above you that is putting these things in place that you need to respect. And we actually have a great um, video on our on our channel I, um, going through the Apocrypha, and I, I believe I titled it, um, oh gosh, it was a, around worship was the title but the point of the video is like when we are doing worship we need to do it in a reverent way and they mention that here in this article um and that's how i think we should keep in mind is like there, there's a reverent way in which to correct or to to call for change or correction where we think there needs to be change or correction and until there is change and correction we still need to conduct ourselves when we're when we're in church in a reverent way so whatever liturgy your church is using, you know, whatever worship style they're using, be as reverent as you can towards God, because part of the purpose of worship is worship of God. It is directed towards God, and that is why it needs to be reverent. And that, that is all for today. Um, not the most uh, probably controversial articles for some, and super controversial um, for others, but just kind of some history there. And feel free to ask more questions in the comments. I highly, highly, highly recommend going to watch Gavin Orton's video on the particular question of mandating celibacy for priests. Um, that was ended up being a big deal and a big controversial point. But of course, I think when you're mandating a restriction on something that even the apostles and those under them were not under, and in fact, it seems most of them were in fact married, um, it, it seems very strange and very wrong, to just put it bluntly, um, to try and then restrict what, that which the scriptures themselves do not restrict. That feels like a very stringent form of legalism, eh, which is a big problem. And that that's kind of all um, for you guys today. Be sure to check out our other videos in this playlist. We're going to have one, maybe two more videos. Um, I might try to fit these last articles, 23, 24, and 25, all into one single video. We'll see. Um, check out our Discord. Check out our playlist on our channel. We have tons of resources in the Discord for learning um, about specific Protestant traditions, about Methodism, about Christian living, and our playlists on our channel as we're building them and adding more and more are the exact same thing. Um, not the exact same resources, but the same purposes. So feel free to check those out. They're wonderful resources. With that, you guys go in peace and have a good day. God bless.